Hello, everyone. <laughs> Alessandro, hey, cheers. Uh, um, thanks for uh, having me, having my back last week uh, in, in the episode with a uh, really cool episode that you did uh, on the robotic stuff. Um, I'm back. Cheers, everyone. Uh, we have a really cool episode planned for you today. Welcome to Innovation Coffee, Arm Innovation Coffee. Today, we're going to be meeting with a bunch of people, actually. We have three guests uh, from all over the place talking about ARM developer workstations. So we're joined by Matthew Petri, who's going to be representing Pine64. We're going to be talking with John Nettleton, who's representing Solid Run. And we have uh, Sahaj Saroop. So uh, Sahaj has been on here a bunch of times representing 96 boards, uh, three very knowledgeable people. And um, if, you are, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them our way. We'll bring them to our guests. But before we dive into today's episode, uh, which of course I'm very excited about, Alessandro, last week I was absent. I was on vacation. I was, you know, as you can tell, I'm a bit rusty right now. Uh, you covered you covered me, and thank you so much. Uh, you did a great job. I got to watch some of it. Um, could you give us a recap of, of last week's episode? Absolutely. First of all, welcome back. It was uh, it was sad. <laughs> it was sad to be alone last week. I, I yeah. actually, you know, I do really enjoy doing this show with you. So it was, it was sad to have to be alone. But it was we had a really great episode. It was uh, the title was actually becoming an avatar. Um, we had a chance to speak to um, someone. Uh, well, actually, the creator of Roboy, um, and uh, we talked about robotics and a lot of really cool topics around. Uh, what does it mean to kind of, uh, uh, you know, what do, what does telepresence really mean when it comes to uh, kind of living or, you know, being part of a robot? And uh, uh, we talked about, about uh, the concept of embodiment when it comes to robotics. Um, and we talked about a lot of, uh, you know, really kind of a, a grand vision that um, the, the team of Roboy has. Uh, it was really, really awesome. And uh, yeah, you can check it out. It's uh, it's obviously on our YouTube channel and uh, feel free to have a look at it after this episode. But today, as Robert said, I'm excited because we're going to talk about ARM workstations. And we have uh, we have actually, have we ever had three guests on, Robert? I think so. I think so at one point, maybe. <laughs> it's it's going to be a crowded one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's going to be yeah. a good one. Alexandra, real quick, before we do that, though, um, I, you've launched another live stream. And I, I kind of was yes, hoping you could tell us a little bit about that, too. Yeah, we have actually. We had a, a new live stream launched yesterday. It's actually um, a slightly different live stream in the sense that it's more of a um, very, it's a deep dive on uh, one of our technologies or one of the technologies that we're working on, uh, an open source project called Embed OS. Uh, it's, uh, it's an RTOS um, for microcontrollers. And uh, it's, uh, it's a live stream that I'm hosting with the tech lead of, uh, of Embed OS. And uh, we get to speak to the engineers working on Embed OS and all, um, you know, a bunch of developers actually developing stuff in uh, in the community, and it's uh, it's super exciting. I mean, we had a we had someone actually talking about how they built uh, rockets with Embed OS yesterday, so it was uh, it was super super exciting to have them on the first episode. Thanks yeah, well, give me a chance to speak about that. Yeah, super well received. I was watching it yesterday. I mean, there was a lot of people on there. Great questions coming up. So, I mean, awesome. I look forward to to the next episode already. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's dive into this. You ready, Alessandro? Three guests. We're gonna bring them in one at a time and uh, let you get to know them all uh, a little bit. Uh, of course, we like calling this kind of like the origin story, building out their credibility a bit. We have our first guest here, who is Matthew. Petri. He is the community systems admin developer for Pine64 and emphasis there on the community. He's doing a great job. Yeah. Pine64 community is amazing. Matthew, welcome. Hello. Happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, so like what we usually do here, we'd love to just kind of hear your origin story, what you do. Um, if you want to share some fun anecdotes about yourself, um, of course, let the audience know kind of, uh, you know, what you like doing in the space. Okay. So Personally, I'm a computer engineering student down at the University of Alabama in the U.S., if you're not aware, and uh, doing some really fun stuff there because like computer embedded stuff is kind of just one of my passions in general. Also doing some fun stuff with a design team for making uh, Martian excavation rovers. But uh, more in line with like Pine64, which for people who aren't aware, it's like a really community and open source focused group like a community and a business working together to make open source uh 
mostly Linux powered devices based on ARM and a few other platforms. And in terms of that, like it was kind of a untraditional way of getting into this. Like I am not even really an employee. Like there are very, actually there are zero employees for Pine64. Like it's very largely community focused. In my case, it's pretty much just, I started like anyone else in the community. I happened to find the uh, Pine64 Kickstarter for the original Pine A64 board here. Cause I was like 15, $25 SBC. That sounds great. And over time, it'll be like whenever they need a little extra help with something, whether it's this admin or developing this piece of software or that, I would offer to help. And eventually, I end up in this position where I'm based as sysadmin for a large amount of the uh, Pine64 infrastructure, as well as still developing this or that every once in a while, like the uh, pre order system for the Pinebook Pro, if anyone remembers that from a year ago. I, I love I love that model. By the way, you keep saying like Pine sixty four community. It's run by the community. I mean, yeah. I, there is, I don't think there's a community that I've encountered is you know around so far uh, as vibrant as and as engaged as as the Pine sixty four community. And I think probably most of the viewers on YouTube right now are from Pine sixty four. Thanks for the tweet. Uh, but yeah, welcome everyone. We hope you enjoy. Uh, we have a lot of cool stuff to show you, Matthew. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring on the next guest. So John Nettleton from Solid Run, who is S Chief Systems Architect for Solid Run. Cheers, John. <laughs> Cheers. Got to make sure having me on again. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Um, so you know, please, quick introduction if you don't mind. Yeah. So I, uh, um, as Robert said, I'm the Chief Systems Architect for Solid Run. Um, I've done a couple of videos with ARM now. Uh, most people will know me as kind of the community face for our Honeycomb board, which has been a, a developer workstation that we launched earlier. Um, but of course, you know, we work in lots of different areas besides just workstations. We do networking gear, um, which the Honeycomb ties into as well. Um, and then embedded IoT, small edge, neural network, accelerators, all sorts of fun stuff. Awesome. Yeah. And we've done some cool videos. I think uh, you and I, we did yeah. a uh, uh, some videos breaking down that device you have behind you, which I believe yep. you're joining us from right now. It is your Honeycomb workstation. That is correct. This is all right. coming from my ARM64 workstation. Yeah, we'll get to we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But yeah, thank you, John, for the introduction. You bringing in our next okay. guest, Alessandro? Sure. I was just going to say first before before we do that, you gave away the, the John's demo. <laughs> we talked about uh, it before. <laughs> that's fine. We can it's talk okay. more about it. <laughs> we can talk more about it. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I want to. I want to hear all about it. Let's bring on the last that? guest before. Before yeah. Before talk, diving into the tech. All right. So Sahaj Saroop, applications engineer extraordinaire uh, from ninety six boards at Lenaro. Uh, Sahaj, welcome. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not good to be here. You know what to do. Uh, you know. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the application engineer at 96 boards. Uh, we make a bunch of SBCs based on a fixed form factor design so that you can plug on add-on cards, uh, which are common to all of our SOC agnostic designs, uh, SOC agnostic boards. Um, and when I'm not working on documentation, I'm usually working on making cool demos for conferences and to show off uh, on on these days more virtual conferences. And I started as a reviewer of ARM SBCs and some ARM code uh, on YouTube for a long time. And that's how I got in touch with the 96 Boats community and just joined them. <laughs> so yeah, so still review um, and you know, I, I remember yeah, Sahaj, yeah. Sahaj when he was a uh, just a, a wee pup, um, he was <laughs> participating in the ninety six boards forums and he was outpacing all of our support team. So we were looking at all the the metrics like, ah, who's this Sahaj guy who's you know basically third place, fifth place in 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 how many threads he's responding to or creating. Next thing you know, he's first place by like leaps and bounds, and we're like, we got to hire this guy. So um, that was a uh, that was those were some good times. All right. Yep. Well, welcome everyone to the show. Welcome. So, so ARM workstations, this is the first topic and this is how we're going to do it. So everyone knows, of course, we will take anyone's questions in the threads or in the chat in the YouTube chat. 
Uh, so make sure if you do have questions for any of our guests here, post them there. We'll bring them to them as soon as possible. But we have a few topics, so big, big, big picture topics that we want to talk about. We're going to let everyone have a chance to talk about it. And then we're going to roll into some personal questions that address their specific fields of interest. So we have Pine64, Solid Run, and 96 boards. So starting off, ARM Workstation. What is an ARM Workstation? How does it differ from a single board computer, SBC, or other ARM devices? Over to you, Matthew, first. What's an ARM Workstation? Okay, so I think like starting out like a more general standpoint, a workstation would be a device where you can get any work you need to get done throughout the day done without any major compromises. Well, if like an SBC, a lot of people more think of them like for like experimentation or makerspace sort of stuff. While with a workstation, it's something that's actually meant to be used as a daily driver, more or less. And I think that's kind of the position that ARM platforms have started to very recently probably get into and find kind of their coming of age and being able to be your daily driver system. Sounds about right. Anything yeah, I to add? agree with that. <laughs> yeah, so anything to add? Uh, not really. I mean, it's funny. Normally, you would think of a workstation more of what we have with Honeycomb, where um, it's about adding uh, expandable storage, like NVMe and SO DIMMs and, and PCIe cards. And, uh, you know, something that we really traditionally think of in the x86 world. But it, it's actually quite amusing that more and more x86 is going towards all everything's built directly onto the board and we're slowly building up and build, making more expandable and robust systems that can be upgraded. So, so, more, that's all. <laughs> so I'm, think, I'm trying to think about like benefits here. So, right. Uh, you know, what, what, what benefits would a developer have by choosing an arm based workstation over you know, these traditional x86 workstations that everyone's so used to, right? Like I, I now have these options. I can go to the store, I can buy this Pinebook Pro, I can go buy the Honeycomb, I can go get a C630 Lenovo. These are all ARM based, right? But why would I choose that? Why wouldn't I just go with my traditional uh, laptops that I've been using for, for years? I think for ARM only development, um, what's necessary is to, be able to compile on the same machine you test on because if you're running it on, uh, compiling it on x86, you either have a test machine set up so you need to deal with their two machines there and if you're emulating, then that's just slow. So you need a machine that runs the architecture you're targeting that has enough memory and enough storage to hold your source codes, your repositories and also compile them. Um, so I, it's just when you need to target ARM at such a massive scale, it's just easier to have a workstation-like machine where you have enough freedom to do stuff and multiple stuff at once. Just a native development platform is sort of what I think of ARM workstation as. I mean, so like the world does kind of run on uh, on ARM, it feels like, right? You have all these end devices, everything is ARM at the end, you know, even talking about embed, right? Like all these devices, these small sensors to microcontrollers, uh, single board computers, you're building on ARM for ARM. That, that's pretty yeah. much a win-win, right? Yeah. What? Yeah, and I and the way I see it is especially with uh, for the developer community who we're really targeting is it's one thing to write software, deploy it on a device, and test for how you expect it to work, but that's not what really grows software and the whole um, platform you're going to build it on. You're going to by running it as your daily driver, you're going to find little bugs. You're going to find little performance things that and hitches that you normally wouldn't see if you're just you know testing it for this one application. And that's really what we see as a needed stepping stone to move from. Okay, we have ARM in the cloud now. We need something in the hands of developers so they're using it all the time and starting to to really like get these little performance tweaks and bits and pieces out of the different um, distributions, operating systems, any, you know, whatever what you want to run on it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's about how much of the code path you can test. And if you're just ro you using one embedded system for one particular task, it's just one code path that you're testing over and over, over again. I do have a kind of a personal story about this. So I had this, 
um, um, server gifted to me by David Tischler, uh, a good arm um, friend. And um, I intend this has like 14 hard drive port, uh, SATA ports on it. So I intended to use it as a NAS storage device. Um, so I do all my tests with um, MD RAID and soft, uh, Linux soft RAID on it, uh, create the Linux software, and I see errors. I see weird errors that make my data go away. So I'm scared. Um, I, we, I report this to the Fedora and Red Hat people because that's what I was running on it. Uh, turns out there's an old bug, and this is AMD processor, uh, AMD's ARM processor, uh, and there's an old bug in a uh, Linux RAID code path that has to do with ARM64 and the cryptographic engine that AMD uses that hasn't, hadn't been tested ever. Um, so yeah, stuff like that comes out all the time and it's just about getting these devices to a hand of like everyday developers that can you know run different scenarios as their daily uh, workload, I guess. Yeah, so I can be... Oh, sorry, Matthew. Okay, I can definitely agree with it that it's really important to get these devices in the hands of developers and let them actually be able to use them. It, like it's not, they're not just toys anymore. It's actually their daily driver machine. Like for example, I know people who've been using the Pinebook Pro as their daily driver, like as they go on in daily life, using it for as their only machine. But on the other hand, I also know there's a lot been, he's got a Pinebook Pro too. So I know there's- Everybody pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of development work done on these. Like I believe in particular the uh, open source Panfrost driver for a certain generation of ARM Mali GPUs was very largely developed on a Pinebook Pro. I was gonna, so, so I was that's gonna be, you get. Yeah, and, I'm gonna be a bit of a devil's advocate here. Sorry, sorry guys. I was gonna be like asking a hard question actually. So, so. <laughs> so be ready. Um, no, I think I think it's you know super interesting, right? Like we're saying there's more and more workstations for people to choose from, right? Yeah. But it comes with a cost. Sahaj mentioned that there is uh, there is bugs uh, that you know are still found uh, in in different workstations or in different uh, distributions. Um, and uh, Matthew, you mentioned that there is like a lot of development still in uh, you know happening now. And I mean, John, you guys are doing a lot of development as well. Um, I guess my question is. You know what does what benefit does someone get from using uh, an ARM-based workstation today? Like I think it's kind of a twofold thing. First thing is that let's be honest, we're all nerds. We like the next big thing. We want to always be on the fanciest, newest devices, and ARM is that at the moment. As well as in a little bit more practical sense, like at least in the case of mobile devices like this, like the case of battery life, like for pretty much as long as you can think back. ARM devices have been significantly more power efficient than x86 or many other architectures. Like again, I keep pointing at the Pinebook Pro, like it's a $200 device with a relatively small battery actually, yet if, if I just let it sit back there all day, it could be doing, sitting there doing basic tasks like 16, 17 hours. So, and uh, good luck getting out of an XA6 I on was, top of all, I, I'll, I can really say. <laughs> I was actually joking on Twitter, I think yesterday, about adding a heater to all the ARM laptops because they don't get cold enough to keep <laughs> you warm during the night. <laughs> yeah, with this thing, I get it's like a, a little warm patch on like your left leg, but mm -hmm. that's it. And yep. it's, or at least for the Northern Hemisphere, we're getting into the cold part of the year, so. So, so talking about... Um, these ARM developer workstations, and I, you know, some people have been bringing this up in the chat. I, I, we can maybe pick out some, some, some actual comments here, but virtualization, accessing or compiling on ARM based chips in the cloud, like the AWS Graviton 2. <clears throat> you know, I, we may have touched on this a bit, but let's kind of like isolate some of the, the key points here. Why is it important to get these workstations into the hands of developers? And I get like enablement, hardware enablement, stuff like that. Let's let's isolate some of these. Why is it important to get these developer workstations into the hands of developers versus just virtualizing or accessing chips in the cloud? Um, of course, I think you'll get a lot more uh, power, a lot more, um, uh, uh, let's call it compute power in the cloud. But, you know, you still have these workstations and they still serve a purpose. What's the purpose? The absolute purpose. The absolute purpose, I think, sign the name to get your work done, whatever mm -hmm. that work is. Nice. Yeah, I mean, Tough. like, you, I, however powerful you make this, right? 
I'm not going to do my work on an SBC. It has to be a system that can like have a good amount of storage that I can rely upon a lot. That is not my main development machine. Like I don't touch my my actual workstation at all. It's there. It's made. It's there once, and it's then on all the time. Um, and that's what we want. Is if if we want these things to go as a daily driver into people's hand, then they need to be of a quality and with the software stack that you can trust. And you can be like, all right, this is a twenty-four hours thing. You can do all your work on it, and you know. Yeah. So and so. One, one sorry, thing I want to mention here that I actually saw show up in the uh, YouTube chat is someone saying that their idea of a workstation is something like 32 gigabytes of RAM, a ton of CPU cores, like being this p powerful beast of a machine. While, yes, for many of us, that's what we think of when we hear workstation. We think of really high end professional machines, but that's not always necessarily the case. Like for a certain application, that's your workstation. You need all that high end performance. But for other people, your workstation may be a little bit more pedestrian, something they can take with you or something that doesn't break the bank or whatever works for you. So like we need this whole wide scale of usable daily driver devices from the monster machines all the way down to the low power devices. So this, oh, sorry, Alessandro, please. You know, I was actually gonna uh, call, call upon John here. And say uh, and ask John what he thinks about because I think uh, have you answered on what a workstation is and uh, and I think what the, you know Robert asked about the difference between the cloud and the, the workstation because I think you you've got something special there right so do you want to kind of give your opinion and or your view well well our opinion is uh, um, the workstation is like the tool that's right in front of you and where we see as a company one of the things we are focusing on is the edge and even the cloud, you know, re remote servers and deployments. But what we do want to see is um, there are a lot of, and, and we've had de other developers who have bought the Honeycomb specifically for this, where they want to leverage Graviton, Graviton2, AWS services, ARM cloud services. But at the same time, they want to be able to do their CI and testing on their local machine as well. So they're not always relying on those services um, also running up a bill, even though they say they're cheaper. I mean, if, if you have a 16 core machine with 32 or 64 gigabytes of memory, you know, that's plenty powerful to run a web browser on. And uh, you can almost get like 10 Chrome tabs and it's so it's all good. Um, <laughs> but but you can also virtualize environments. You can run containers. You can do testing locally, which, again, helps you re you know iterate on your development quicker. So, so I, uh, this may sound like, uh, and thank you, John, th but this may, this may sound like a naive question. I think I brought this up at one point in a previous innovation coffee, Alessandro, possibly during like one of our pre arm software dev channel ones, but do we ever see like an ecosystem similar to, you know, x86 when it comes to gaming on arm, right? So like, if you want to go build a gaming computer, a workstation or what you want to call a gaming PC at, at, for your house, you go get your motherboard, you choose your chip, it's all standardized, it pops right in, either AMD or Intel, and it just pops right in there. Do, do we see an ecosystem evolving similar to this, or are we going to kind of continue to see these workstations that are, you know, the chips are kind of just embedded on there, they're maybe on a SOM or something like that. Um, is there ever going to be a, a, an ecosystem like that? I think to some extent we're already seeing that ecosystem, maybe not so much for like a home gamer environment, but we're already seeing it for like the server workspace. Mm -hmm. Like, I, sorry, I don't remember which company owns them now, but the uh, Thunder X chips, to X2, X3, those are already socketed mini core chips that you can put in a motherboard and pick which chip is best for you. And yeah, I, think that, I think this is not a one-off thing. Like eventually that will trickle down to uh more price sensitive environments like the home. Nice. Yeah, NVIDIA is so in the on the cloud NVIDIA is partnering with Ampere to have like these cloud gaming servers for Android devices. So they basically run like Android and virtual machines and you can just stream the games from them. Yeah. But on again, a more I, I don't even think it's just um 
there's that's twofold. Um, not mm-hmm. just running ARM in the cloud to run Android games, but just cloud gaming in general. I think is mm-hmm. starting to actually remove some of this. You know, if you have a local ARM workstation and you want to play games, you know, I can log into my NVIDIA, um, what is it? NVIDIA GeForce Cloud or whatever it's yeah. called, and, and stream, you know, whatever the latest game is also. And like for home gaming, we already have the Switch that runs ARM. Uh, I think the next gen consoles may go to ARM because they are getting really, really, really warm to the touch. They are not cool devices and that will limit them. Um, So move to a cooler platform, you get much more thermal headroom to clock your chips higher, clock your GPU higher. You know, you don't need that much uh, CPU grunt. Um, The, I think as for the desktop, market we need to make a gaming we need to spec out a few dozen gaming arm desktop with like nice gpus because gpu drivers are at that point nvidia has arm 64 gpu drivers that work with newer gpus so you just make them and you send a bunch of to steam and you know through valve and be like dude port port stuff to them make make proton work on them as you do on x86 and you know just about getting those again getting the arm workstations on game dev sans I, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in and 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 say, you know, we've covered, we, we talked about workstation, but we've actually covered a, quite a big range, I believe, right? We went all the way from, uh, kind of, you know, laptops to, um, more or less, basically, cloud clouds in clouds in your in your desktop uh, environment, right? Or in, you know, in in a kind of, um, not cloud, but I mean, you know, like a big workstation, kind of running mm-hmm. the same workloads as uh, as cloud workloads. Um, and then there is another class of devices that we haven't covered yet. Actually, I think we mentioned it uh, in passing earlier, SPCs. And, and you know, Sahaj, earlier you said, actually, uh, SPCs are something different, something that you wouldn't use to run your, like, daily workloads. I wonder, actually, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear your views on what's the difference between an SPC? Why couldn't you use an SPC to run your, uh, your kind of, you know, your, I don't know, like, uh, so Excel I, or Word document or whatever it is? Uh, so... Yeah, with my look into, you know, with my sort of the 96 words hat on what I treat SBCs are, a platform to develop software on for the SOCs. So if I'm doing my enablement on these things, that means they they are already always running stuff that might not be super reliable because that's the test code. That's the, you know, unverified stuff that I'm working on towards getting stabilized, towards getting a much more stable release of. So to work on the same device you're developing on is a bit iffy. Um, You need, again, uh, a more specced out and a more stable system that you don't update every day or that you don't flash, reflash every day. As per the hardware, can I just keep a hardware down that acts as a daily driver for me? Um, and is also an SBC. I've just not seen something with enough RAM at the moment or fast enough RAM e- even. Like a good example is the Pi 4. Uh, you know, good job on being the first ones to have a 8 gig bu- gigabyte RAM SBC out there, but it's also very slow RAM. On, and also it doesn't have like fast storage. So there's like a combination of minimum requirement to be a workstation uh, personally for me, that a lot of the SBCs don't reach. Uh, There are some particular kits that are north of $700 price point. At that time, I'm just like, if I'm buying that, why won't I just spend a bit more and buy the honeycomb or something like that? And then, yeah. So, so, so uh, thank you. That's that's a good answer. Alessandro, do you want to say something? I, I just wanted to bring one thing up here before we transition. No, no, that's good. No, thank you, Saj. That, that, uh, that was a good answer. So th- this has been coming up in the YouTube chat. It, a lot of people are talking about it. I mean, we. it seems that there's lots of conversations that I can't even keep up. But the Pi 400 has been brought up multiple times in there. And it is a new device. It's kind of like that borderline between, you know, an SBC and an ARM workstation. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, and let's just do this roundtable once again. What do you think of the Pi 400? Is it an ARM workstation? And just, I mean, I, I'll say personally, I think it's pretty awesome. Like, I want one. I don't have one yet. I think it's pretty cool. But, oh, you met you first, Matthew. 
Okay, so yeah, like I saw the news on the Pi 400 as soon as it came out, and my first thought was that is actually a great idea. Like it, like for a while, the Raspberry Pi people have been trying to make their devices as user friendly as possible. Like trying to, like I think their original focus was to make something that could be used in schools. Like I re believe the original like BBC micros were in the 80s. So like, I think the Pi 400 is just their first step in that, making this really cute user-friendly device for bringing ARM to all sorts of uh, groups that aren't so comfortable with having this little green uh, single board computer in front of them. So so on that note, while you were talking there, Matthew, and I, I love your comments, Martian says that Pi 400 is a toy. And I think that this was, this was kind of, and as we transition into John's area here, this is kind of, I think, something that came up while you were talking on Twitter uh, last week, trying to find these cool features. So maybe you could tell us what do you think about the Pi 400 and um, why why would people think that this is kind of a toy versus something that's more industry or, you know, let's call it more robust, ready for developers like the Honeycomb? Um for the Pi 400, I mean, uh, well, I my first computer was a Commodore 64, so the form factor just kind of it's it's not new, but it's it's functional, um, and I do like the fact that it is something that is approachable, um, and I'll talk about it later. It's a, it's it's the idea of um, getting the we're bringing back our cue box, and it's the idea of bringing, like you said, not having a developer board with cables hanging all off of it, having something that's a little bit easier to just plug in some USB and HDMI cable and run with it. Um, one of the big things that is differentiating from the Pi 400, and I know with the Raspberry Pi 4, there is, um, it has reached a systems ready standard. Um, I don't think the Pi 400 is is involved in that. There's some differences that are keeping it away. But, uh, and what we're doing with the Honeycomb, and it's the idea that um, the firmware that's on it is able to just boot up and run at least to the point where you can install other things you need to to get the rest of the devices working. You know, it covers the USB, it covers the uh, SATA, PCIe if it exists, has a standard serial port. Um, all those pieces are what's evolving at the low level space that's going to make. Now, it's not going to say, oh, we'll just take a socketed system on a chip and plug it in, but it's going to let you take a board grab Fedora, grab Ubuntu, grab VMware, grab Windows, and put it on the device and have it mostly function to the point where you can then bring up the rest of the devices if you need to get other drivers. And I, and I think that's r really the, what's going to be driving. And I'm not saying like this is U-Boot has to go away. There, There's the embedded spec for that as well, which is going to add some of the features from UEFI to keep to do UEFI booting, it's just still gonna boot from a device tree. Um, and having that unified boot that all the distributions can share is gonna be what's very important for kind of bridging that gap between an SBC, an embedded SBC and what's something that's gonna be a, a desktop or a workstation, you know, something in that category. Yeah, I kind of wonder how the U-boot ACPI stuff's coming along these days. I've not had a lot of chance to look at it. Well, it's making progress, so I'm already looking at it. So it's it's doing a good job. Nice. All right, cool. Sahaj, did you want to talk about the Pi 400 real quick, or do we move on to the next? I, I just say it's a, it's a nice educational kit. That's all. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I I think so as well. I mean, uh, I'm I'm excited to to get one. I think it's just pretty cool, but we'll see. Um, so moving on to this next part here. Um. Uh, these are just some questions I think custom tailored towards each of you. Uh, we're going to start with John, and I, you know, I, we, we talked about this Twitter post that you posted. Uh, I want to, I want to just dive a little deeper into this. Um, I'm going to read the Twitter post if that's okay, and I'm going to post it. Yeah, right there. certainly. So let's see, banner. I, I put it here. <laughs> what would? And I, I did cut a little bit because it only allows 200 characters on this thing. But what would be your reasonable dream specs for a device a quarter the size of a Nook, around $100, 
and not something you will throw in a drawer after two weeks like a pie. Now, <laughs> maybe I should have cut off that last part. <laughs> um, everyone's got a pie in their drawer, right? I mean, I, yeah. I think we can, we can all agree with that. We all um, have too many SBCs. We all have too many SBCs. But so well, and and at that price point, it's very. The point is at that exactly. price point. I said around a hundred dollars. It's people will buy them and then play around with them, and then they'll go go to the way to the next one. But you got a lot of feedback on that on that post. Yes, a um, lot more than I expected. <laughs> I think even Saha shared some feedback there. Could could and Marchin, who's in the call right now, who's in the the YouTube channel. Um, could you uh, kind of paint the picture there? What what kind of things people are looking for, and then maybe expand on that because I don't think people were were catching the whole price point part of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I and it's something I already knew from the honeycomb in general is people want even if it's less cores, they just they want faster cores, faster single thread. In general, a lot of people were relatively reasonable, two to four fast cores. Um, memory is always a big one, uh, and I and I don't disagree with that. Uh, now, given as we move forward, that might change a little bit, right? Because if you're building your dream system on a chip, you can always do um, hardware compressed memory. So eight gigabytes will get you a lot further, things like that. Um, but uh, uh, most of it is standards booting, like I already said, UEFI boot, so they can put whatever they want on it. Um, GPUs are an inter interesting one because people obviously want open source drivers or, or those sorts of things. But um, uh, and we'll have to see where things go with NVIDIA and AMD moving forward. I mean, Molly's doing a good job, but you know, people want like gaming GPUs, <laughs> you know, something bigger. Um, and then run silently is always important. That's something that people um, come up with. And, I think in general, and some people went through the roof, like I said, it kind of turned into a big Christmas wish list as well. I guess we're close to the holiday season. So some of the things got a little off the rails. But in general, I just like to see what people are looking for and, and what they think in the 100 to $200 price point. So, so, so what are you and Solid Run doing about this wish list? Um, is there is there a future honeycomb iteration that that's coming out? Or is there something that we might be looking forward to? I don't, I'm, I'm it's just general curiosity. No, in general, it was just general curiosity. I, I'm just seeing what people want. Um, obviously, we're an OEM ODM. We we make the boards, we make the SOMs. We can only build the machine with there. We can only build the machines that one of the silicon vendors makes a system on the chip that kind of fits into where we want to where we want to be so it's not like we can just magically make this out of thin air it would be great if we could um but there's there's going to be progress but i always like to kind of get a feel for what do developers want because that's um kind of the divining rod towards where we should be looking as the market comes down the pipe and if things are available to us, well, it's just the next big thing. I mean, that's kind of where Honeycomb was born from, was that same divining rod of developers saying, oh, I want something that's under $1,000. And I know people, they always want it cheaper, but uh, gen generally under $1,000, UEFI, um, PCIe, all, all those pieces can just run a normal GPU, work in a normal case. And that's, like I said, it's kind of the divining rod to give us an idea of what we should be targeting next and where we should be going. John, I'm curious, uh, you know, you mentioned that you're trying um, as a company to like kind of reach developers and do, you know, build things that, they're, you, that are useful for them. How do you actually, uh, what is your, uh, you know, kind of trick to understand what developers want? Because I think that's a big challenge, right? So how do you go about like understanding uh, kind of what is the next big thing that you could build? I'm curious. Well, a lot of it's community based. It's uh, we started way back in IRC, and now we've with the Honeycomb, we've actually migrated to the developer ecosystem. Um, uh, when we first started with the original QBox, we were heavily. Um, I actually came from the developer community, like Matthew said, he did with the Pine sixty four, and Sahaj said as well with uh, the ninety six boards. Um, where I was a community member um, working with the company. Uh, but in general, we try to 
feed developer boards as much as possible out to um, people in the community and work with those communities. You know, we want Fedora running on our stuff. We want people from ARM to have our stuff. We want people from Ubuntu or SUSE or, you know, Debian um, or B the BSDs. We have a lot of BSDs developers who are really excited about uh, the honeycomb. And uh, it's, Getting your hand, like getting the hardware into the hands of developers, is is where you get started. But you also need to enable the communication, and that's and just in general having like the community where we can all talk, like in the developer ecosystem, you kind of pick up on the the common. I gotta I gotta do a plug. theme. I gotta do a plug here because you keep mentioning developer ecosystem. People are gonna. <laughs> If if you want to go talk with John directly, he is super active in our Discord server, okay? Oh, there you go, Alessandro. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Discord.gg forward slash dev eco. Um, I know uh, all you folks at Pine64, you also have an amazing Discord server. I'm in there. Um, but if you want to go talk about Solid Run or 96 boards or ARM stuff, go cruise over to dev eco. We also take care of you there. Um, so John's very active in the Solid Run channel on dev eco. All right. That's my plug. Thanks, John. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. if I, if and I may just, I am still on IRC too, but that the, <laughs> oh, that cool. traffic's going slower and slower, less and less. And I wanted I wanted to just kind of like uh, build on your point. I think it's it's super cool. Like what you what you're doing, and I think you know everybody on the call actually is kind of working on you know kind of on the same um, type of uh, doing a similar type of job, and and I, everybody's doing a really good job actually. Um, and it's really cool because I feel like, you know, we're a diverse community of developers all over the world, right? And, uh, uh, you know, with this year, with this year with COVID, like we're not actually traveling anywhere. We're all kind of sitting at home doing doing stuff. But actually, it feels it feels like we're, you know, so like, I don't know. It, 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 I think I've been on on uh, on uh, DevEco and I've been on other channels like that uh, way more than I probably have in the, in the past because of because of me traveling less and it's super cool to see, you know, all these communities like come together and like build stuff together, as you were saying, right, John, like you talk to uh, all these other uh, people out there and you kind of get them to build stuff on top of, uh, of, of, of what you're building. And it's, it's super cool to see that ecosystem really kind of grow and, and grow together. Right. I, I, I'm really passionate about that personally. Things are still happening. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on to Pine64, John. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. appreciate appreciate you. You talking about that. So, so Pine64, we have some good questions here. Um, I think that, you know, when you're talking about this community model uh, at the beginning when you were introducing yourself, I think we talked a little bit in the green room before the, the live stream started. Let's, let's just kind of go down the list here, right? So Pine64 is a very community-oriented uh, mm -hmm. company. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how is this community managed, you know, um, splitting the hardware aspect to the software aspect? Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll start with that. So, so Matthew, walk, walk us through this Pine64 community. Okay, so I may have mentioned this earlier or it might have been in the green room, as you put it, but the uh, Pine64 community is very much within two sections. There's the business side of it and the community side of it. And they work very well together, but in... One significant way they differ. The uh, business side of things handles the hardware. The community side handles the software, mm -hmm. which we found kind of important because A, communities are how devices grow, and B, one of our focuses is to make free open source platforms. And whenever you separate the software from the uh, hardware aspects, you kind of remove the possibility of even letting the like proprietary existing blobs into your hardware. So. And, and so, so looking at this, like, so you're saying pine 64, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, the folks that actually run that, right. We've gotten some, these very thankful, very grateful. This, this was actually sent to us from uh, pine 64 folks. We were able to distribute yeah. some of these to our arm innovators, including Sahaj. Uh, you got one of those. Um, so the hardware comes with Manjaro pre-installed, right? For the uh, Pombo Pro in particular, yes. Originally, it had a variant, a uh, custom variant of Debian that was running on a board support package kernel. But thanks to the work of a whole lot of developers, the Pombo Pro, and in fact, at this point, pretty much all our devices run on fully mainline Linux. So, like, if you want to run the latest software, you absolutely can. 
And that's a very incredible place to be in. And it's taken the work of a whole lot of developers for several years, but we finally got in there. And the community, the community is also enabling uh, other operating systems. I mean, I think I just saw something recently about Fedora running on it. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. There's all sorts of Linux versions. Like I already, there was, we already had Manjaro and Debian mentioned. There's Ubuntu versions. There's Fedora. I think, at least for the original Pinebook, which I'm probably going to get the show and tell eventually, but at least for the original Pinebook, there's also Slackware for those Slackware fans out there. And even moving beyond Linux, like people have been making uh, free and I believe open BSC work on the Pinebook Pro, as well as I think there's at least an initial port of Risk OS. Yeah, I, I was actually very surprised. I mean, when my Pinebook showed up, booted it up. Sahaj, you made a great video on Pine64. I'm sorry, on the Pinebook Pro. I don't know, maybe you would have you, you have anything to add to this? I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of interested in just kind of hearing you guys talk a little bit more about it. Um yeah, the upstream support is great for that sock in general, but for the Pine64 as well. I'm still waiting on Peter <laughs> Robinson if you're hearing yeah. me. Your blog. Your blog I, I, I need to get the U-boot onto the SPI properly, and I need to get the U-boot that is compliant with your OS. Um, but yeah, no, uh, that thing has SPI. Um, I should be able to get it to boot on that and then just flash whatever eBBR supported operating system I can over it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's uh, I, I kind of like the, um, the switch over from, well, to from like the audio jack to the UART and small things like that. Um, of my developer focus mind always goes through, I should have all of that on top on, on my fingertips. I don't have to open the pine book from, to access all of that, but then also it's a more a consumer focused product. So I understand why all the developer options are hidden underneath the lid. So, yeah. So you guys also, you chose, or I mean, I shouldn't say you chose, but the, the on the pine, Book Pro, you have the RK3399 chipset. I mean, I think that's an easy chipset to work with, right? Yeah. It's all up. Uh, we, we, we talked about this in the green room. I'm going to bring it up, and I know you're not going to be able to go too deep into this, but Pine Book Pro or Pro Plus iterations of Pine Book, what, what are we looking at? I, I, I was told that the audience was going to bring this question, but I decided to do it myself. What, what are we looking at, future Pine Book? Okay, like you said, I can't go too much into future plans, but of course we do very much have future plans for chips. In fact, I believe recently we finally announced our plan to build a new gen generation of hardware on the uh, RK3566 uh, system on a chip. So next generation, kind of a replacement for the uh, 3328. Actually, I think it's even higher up the stack than 3328 that we've used on the uh, Rock 64 SBC. So that's going to be for more of our like non-pro sort of devices for a massive upgrade from the previous all-winner A64, which has been powering a large amount of our devices for a while now. It's so like this thing, like I believe Sahaj was talking about earlier, like moving on from stuff like the uh, Cortex A53, like I believe the uh, 3366 or 3566, I still need to get the number straight, has uh, quad A55 cores, a much faster Molly GPU and basically vastly upgrade hardware that should make our devices in the future quite a bit nicer. Because we have seen some complaints about the uh, A64 being uh, maybe a little bit behind, but that's not like raw performance isn't really the focus of our hardware. Our focus is to make open devices that, like, one of the main focuses is, like I mentioned, being able to run mainline Linux and other software, but also being able to ha have it just in general be fully open platforms that anyone can use can develop for so performance is not the main objective there accessibility is i wanted to bring something up actually that that uh that came up earlier so i'm going to put sahaj on the spot here i hope you're ready sahaj <laughs> i i heard before like we, we talked about um you know this running mali um and uh you know earlier we talked about gaming and i think that's a big driver for workstations in general right um and sahaj you've got a surprise for us right you've got did you get yes. doom running on <laughs> i have doom 3 running on the open source drivers show it to us we want to see it otherwise we don't believe it <laughs> <laughs> pixar didn't um, 
I, I, I don't know if my overhead camera would work or if it would show everything upside down. Oh, it it's is true. Oh. <laughs> right, I can just bring it forward. That's fine. Uh, bring the brightness up. And so I just used OR to install it. I didn't have to do a whole lot. And it's like non-modded. Was there a mod for, or was there a bit of stuff required? But for the most part, oops, let me just also change my camera. While you do that, Sahaj, I was going to say like things like this. I'm curious, like, for example, who, who built the support for, uh, who ported Doom? Is it a... a it's it's like, it, so this is like, so with Doom, they started doing open source game engines. And once it's open source, sometimes it's just as easy as adding an ARM64 target to it. And Doom is not just the only game like this that runs like this. Yeah. Like, I really wanted to be able to show, like, at one point I had it installed on my own Pinebook Pro, but apparently I refreshed the OS or something a few too many times. But I had, uh, it's technically Open Arena, I believe it's called, but it's basically mm -hmm. the open port of Quake 3 Arena. And it runs really well on the Pinebook Pro especially with the new uh, Pine Frost open source drivers. And, and yeah, there's, there's, there's that. And then there's the, so the FPS is a bit, a bit low because I think I pushed the graphics a bit too high when I was testing <laughs> it, but essentially it all works. Um, the, um, the other thing was, yeah, the mind test is also a really nice game. It's a Minecraft open source clone. And I've tested that on a bunch of ARM devices. That is a good example of a super portable code because I think it runs on pretty much any architecture from what I've heard. Even like the weird long soon MIPS based stuff from China runs just fine. Like, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask so, everyone a, a, a question here. So, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm a geek when it comes to games. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, you know, when I joined ARM six years ago, uh, I saw, uh, you know, for the first time I saw Mali and what it could do. And it was, you know, all on, on uh, phones. And now like, you know, we're seeing, as we were talking about like more and more workstations also having uh, uh, Mali on it. Uh, and it's super cool that, you know, like the performance is going up and up and up and like, we're able to do all these different things. Uh, but on the other end of the scale, there, there is, I think we mentioned it earlier, actually, um, cloud services, right? That you could run games in the cloud. How do you see the the kind of game, the future of gaming? Do you guys see it as, a cloud service or do you see it as a local service like what what is your uh expectation for that i i i personally think there's a bit more time to have everything rendered on the cloud and sent over there's i i think there would be too much latency especially for india or some other country that doesn't have a huge uh local so um so caching servers or something around to do it because even i for like for example, to take Battlefield 1, uh, I've played that multiplayer quite a lot. That The closest servers I have are in Japan that give me about 160 millisecond of ping. That's not good. And there are issues with that. So I think there's still time to have the entire game render and then just to use your device as controls. And, and like in some places where people live close to this, these uh, rendering farms, that it will work fine. But I think there's still some time for a mass um, rollout. I also think it depends what kind of games you want to play, and you know, if if it's like a RTS game where you're just you know world down clicking around or something like that, I think that's something that's easier to render in the cloud, um, and then bring down. But obviously, if you're doing like a FPS or you know, an arcade style game where you need that super low latency, that's where it becomes a little less, little less plausible. Yeah, I think until 5G the, uh, hits, that's going to fix everything. Either 5G or one of the like things that like I grew up in the rural area, so my family's excited about is uh, SpaceX's Starlink for actually mm -hmm. rural internet that isn't awful. Because like they have their own like beta test there where they're, they're having ping of like, 30, 25, 30 milliseconds, which when you're in a rural area, that is fantastic. Like when you're in those sort of areas, you're lucky if you're on a cell modem, you're probably on a old school satellite where your signal's going up to geostationary orbit and back, which is a second or two of ping right there. I think that, that kind of matches what uh, Carlos is saying here. Uh, he, he doesn't like the idea of games in the cloud. I think that, that the latency is what scares me as well, right? Uh, but yeah. Martin is actually saying that he believes both will... Uh, have a place and i think maybe that's the 
the you know the right answer is probably like yeah, you know I as you said john it depends really mm -hmm. yeah the yeah. main driver for that is like to ha have like less powerful gpus but i've like if you follow the nvidia dlss stuff then they're doing a really great job of just rendering at a lower resolution and then using ai to scale it up and it's actually pretty yeah. good so that might be mm -hmm. a solution somewhere so we have to i have to bring everyone back to reality here the show is going to be over in a few minutes um i want to real quickly so so each one of you are going to get a second to, to kind of give us your shameless plug but john you have this amazing device behind you i know we did a full video on it i'll share that in the description so for anyone who's watching but john could you just like kind of give us a little view of it are you able to pop your webcam up and show us or um because uh, let me see if my cable there we go there you go and my mess of the desk but like I said, developer. Yeah, mine's water cooled. It's I got all the fun geek stuff on there. Uh, I do have LEDs and RGB running as well, but that's not currently uh, doing anything interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's Honeycomb. Um, it's uh, it's it's we're doing really well. Uh, we're trying to get them out to developers as fast as possible. Uh, they are selling it, not just to developers, but to other people who uh, are looking to build products on them. They're, we're really kind of shipping them out as fast as we can. Uh, and come join our community. We'd love to talk to you. And we're having a great time, you know, working with VMware, um, working with the different um, distributions and operating systems to get it enabled and, and getting people develop more developers involved in UEFI development in general, because that's one of the other things is, um, this has been going on for multiple years, you know, long time getting EDK2 in shape, but we need more developers who are getting their hands dirty in there and, and building that as a firmware out. Nice. So, John, this is this is your shameless plug. You get another second here. Send people over to Solid Run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, check us out, www.solid-run.com. Uh, we actually just launched this week a uh, redesign of our website. Um, if Check us out on the Discord published. We're uh, hashtag solid run. I'm Linux for Kicks on Twitter. Uh, if you want to come and join any of the other uh, crazy proposals I throw out there and give your input. Awesome. Thanks John. A lot. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. All right, Matthew, you're up. Pine64. Okay, so Pine64, like I hope to be able to do show and tell of all these amazing devices we hear, like. Like we have right there at pine64.org. If you want to find more about our community, if you want to find, buy some of the devices, it's pine64.com now. And like one thing that I know I'm kind of surprised we have not many questions about is the Pine phone, which is kind of like the other crazy thing other than this that people are excited for. Like one of the first new Linux, fully Linux, mainline Linux uh, smartphones. It's actually in quite a usable state now. I actually have two of them. Like this is the nicer one right here. It's like those are going to be more available soon. And we have all sorts of other things like the uh, Pine Watch. So, yeah, if you want to come see our uh, whatever hardware we have, pine64.org, pine64.com, or come join our community. Like, I don't, I don't even have to talk about how amazing our community is. The rest of these guys have been doing it for me. So, come check us out. And, uh, and, and we're going to have a nice negotiation session with you after this live stream ends to get you back on another call so that we can spend the entire hour just talking about Pine64 stuff. And so you will get an opportunity, I hope, to, to show all of that cool hardware you have behind you in a, in a future yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, because we also want to hear about the Pine yeah. Watch next time. Yeah. We'll bring Thank you back. I'll, I'll talk until you run out of time again. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Last but not least... Sahaj, you're up. Right. So three things to announce. Um, Connect.linar.org. Uh, go there, and uh, we are having our uh, third virtual connect uh, this March. Sadly, we couldn't be uh, physically together. I'm very sad about that. But hey, we'll be there, and we'll talk about good ARM open source stuff. So if you are into ARM and open source, uh, you can come visit us. and. Um, 
take part. So connect.lnr.org, uh, call for papers are open. Um, uh, next up, 96.96boats.org. Uh, 96 if you are interested in SOC agnostic um, SBCs, we got Qualcomm, we've got ST, we've got High Silicon. I've got all of these on my desk. That's why I'm taking those particular names. Um, you know, 96boats.org, come check us out. Um, we are also running, uh, we are also sort of, I'm asking around for uh, whatever you have uh, opinions on the version two spec. So you can go to our website, check out the version one. If you see there's something missing that you'd like to be added, then you can ping us on um, Dev Eco Discord. I'll be there. And um, last but not the least, uh, setsroop.com. That's if you want ARM um, or in general tech blogs, you can catch me there. There's just one blog there, but that's the new website. That's why. So yeah, yeah, visit there. Um, yeah, I guess that's it on man. Can I do a plug as well for all, for everyone here? Oh, no. Um, so <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, fine. I'll leave that. <laughs> um, no. I would. Ju I just want to. So we 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 have in mind to do a a blog uh, showcasing some of the cool projects that from the community, right? So we've put out this um, this form. Um, it's uh, it's it allows you to kind of list out what you've been building, and uh, I'm keen to kind of showcase as much cool stuff from the community as possible. So if you've got anything that you're building. Um, you know, for Christmas specifically, or for uh, you know, I, I think I was talking to some friends recently. They're building some cool stuff for Christmas. So, um, so yeah, if you've got any ideas of cool projects that you want us to showcase, uh, yeah, link it here, uh, and we can we'll reach out to you and we can do something together as well. Uh, maybe we'll invite you on Innovation Coffee as well. And that is case sensitive, by the way. If you don't use the cases, you end up on Woodworking Projects Gallery. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it was kid sensitive. Okay, cool. Good to know. So. Cool. All right, so let's close this out. Um, as always, gosh, I mean, it's just been great. Thank you so much, Sahaz, John, Matthew, for taking this time out of your day. I know you're all busy. Uh, very much appreciated. Everyone on YouTube, you're amazing. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you liked it. Like the video. Follow us on YouTube and uh, join us again next week. Every week we do this at the same time. So um, I'm personally very grateful for everyone who joined us. Thank you so much. Uh, Alessandro, over to you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Robert, for being a great co-host. I feel less lonely this time with you. So uh, it's always great to have you on, on the show. And uh, guys, thank you, John, Sahaj, Matthew. Thank you all for, for joining. It was, uh, it was great to speak to you. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that I put you in the spot a couple of times, but it was uh, really good answers. <laughs> Loved having you in the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Right. It was a lot of fun. See you thank next you week. Thank you to all the viewers as well. See you yeah. next week. Bye-bye. Uh,